One Book uh, Committee, I want to welcome you. Uh, this is the ninth annual One Book, One Region kickoff. My name is Betty Ann Ryder. I'm the director of the Groton Public Library, and I've been involved with this project right from the beginning. Over the years, our One Book choices have brought people together to discuss civil liberties, the Holocaust, health care, immigration, Afghanistan, literacy, war, and many other contemporary issues. We know that this year the tradition will continue, and we will meet our goals of bringing people together to discuss ideas, broadening the appreciation of reading, and breaking down barriers among people. We thank you all for being part of this uh, region-wide reading event. When the One Book Committee makes our choice each year, we're looking for more than a good book. It needs to have some substance, some quality that brings people together to discuss what they've read. Our library partners like to be able to offer related programs. Over the year, this has led to some memorable evenings for me. I've hosted one of the original Negro League baseball players, um, a panel from the FBI and the CCLU debating civil liberties, a Holocaust survivor. We show films, we have family programs like kite making, and this year, rain gutter regattas, and we all uh, have a chance to meet the author. What could be better for a librarian? People excited about reading, learning about a new culture or topic or idea, and throngs of people coming to hear an author. It's always the highlight of my year. And I know this year will be no exception. Tori Murden McClure's story of her solo adventure on the Atlantic in a 23-foot plywood boat with no motor or sail captures your imagination from the start. If you're like me, happy to be reading about it from the sofa, um, 3,000 miles, 14-hour days of rowing, hurricanes, 30-foot waves, 80-some days on your own, and no one to take over when you get tired. I don't know. <laughs> It's hard to believe we've been doing this for nine years. How many of you remember our first book, Snow in August, by Pete Hamill? Okay, so quite a few. Um, I think some people still haven't forgiven us for how that story ended. Well, that won't happen this year. This year's choice, A Pearl in the Storm by Tori uh, McClure, has a great ending. I don't think I'm giving anything away by saying that she achieves her goal. It's going to be a great reader for read a great book for readers in southeastern Connecticut with our long maritime tradition and especially now during our busy boating season. Mystic is really the perfect place to launch our 2010 choice. I want to take this opportunity to thank Bank Square Books, our amazing supportive local independent bookstore. They're co-sponsoring this event and are selling copies of the book in the back of the room. A portion of today's sales will be donated to Literacy Volunteers of Eastern Connecticut. Other words of appreciation go to the members of the One Book Selection Committee, who meet nearly year-round searching for the perfect book. It's not an easy task, but we have been incredibly fortunate over the years because we've chosen books um, whose authors share our enthusiasm about the project and who have generously donated uh, their time to, sp to come here and meet with our readers, something we think is an essential part of the One Book experience. All of us enjoying this special evening and all the other book events um, throughout the summer also owe a big thank you to the Community Foundation of Southeastern Connecticut for their continuing support of the project. And finally, I'd like to express, express my gratitude to the Steamboat Inn and Mystic Arts Center for hosting us this evening. And now I would like to introduce Kit Talbot, who has been a recreational rower and sculler for 25 years. And she has volunteered as a docent for the Rowing History Exhibit at Mystic Seaport and is a member of the Groton Community Boating Club and the Groton Parks and Recreation Commission's Boating Advisory Board, which works with Parks and Rec to promote opportunities for boating and increased access to the water. She is going to help us set the scene about women and rowing and our uh, book for this year. Good evening. It's truly a privilege to introduce our guest of honor, Tori Murden McClure, author of A Pearl in the Storm, the first American and the first woman to row solo across the Atlantic. I understand that I was invited to make the introduction tonight because of my own involvement with rowing, but I'm a little hard pressed to imagine what the similarities are between sculling on the Mystic River 
and uh, rowing a 2,800 pound boat across the Atlantic and surviving two hurricanes in the process. I do believe that, like many people here, we share a love of rowing and an appreciation of the joys and challenges of being alone on the water in a small craft. While the modern sport of rowing can be traced to, the 18th, to 18th century England, women were traditionally pictured reclining on cushions in the stern of a skiff, trailing a hand in the water, while being rowed gently up the Thames by an aristocratic oarsman. Early competitions for women rowers were not actually races, but exhibitions of proper technique, preceding the main event, the men's races. Following the organization of the first US women's crew at Wellesley in 1877, it was nearly 100 years before women's crews were established on a par with men's crews at co on college campuses, with women finally competing in the Olympics for the first time in Montreal in 1976. Tori Murden McClure began rowing at Smith College in 1982, where she was also a star basketball player. In the following years, she moved far beyond typical athletic competitions to scale mountains on several continents, becoming one of two women to ski across Antarctica, simultaneously reaching the South Pole, before achieving her dream of rowing alone across the Atlantic. As she describes so eloquently in her book, her solo row across the Atlantic in the American Pearl was not only an incredible feat of physical endurance, but a quest for personal discovery and fulfillment. One of the entries in her deck log speaks to the true significance of her voyage. Journeys like this are not about what we get out of them, but rather they are about what we give. And in giving so much to life, we learn the vast expanse of wealth we have at hand. It is now my great pleasure to introduce to you Tori Murden McClure, author, renowned athlete, survivor of many storms, and most of all, a human being with profound compassion and courage. Good evening. Uh, first, I need to uh, explain my face. I was, uh, I, you know, rowing is a great sport for temper. <laughs> Roller skiing is not a great sport for temper. I went out early Friday morning in a bit of a snit, and I was, I was skiing in the local park next to our, our house in Louisville, Kentucky, and I went to knock off the brakes on my skis because I just finished coming down a hill and I got my ski pole caught between the brake and the front wheel. And the ski stopped and I didn't. And uh, I landed face first in the asphalt, which was perfect timing because I was to receive an honorary degree this weekend at Smith College. And, <laughs> and it was my 25th reunion weekend and all my classmates said, well, of course you have a black eye. <laughs> So uh, being a rower, I do most things backwards, uh, and uh, it's just a habit. Uh, an example would be that I went to divinity school first, and then I went to law school. Most people go to divinity school after law school to atone for their sins. <laughs> and so I'm going to begin with the last page of my book first. About a year after my successful row, Mac, my husband, who's in the back of the room there, and I had the good fortune to spend a few days with Thor Heyerdahl and his wife at a series of public events in Dijon, France. By that time, I'd grown tired of talking about the trip. I thought, if one more person asks me about a rowboat, I'm going to blow a gasket and fly around the room backward. With this as my frame of mind, it was an invaluable gift to watch Thor Heyerdahl answer question after question about his voyage across the Pacific, which he wrote about in the book Kantiki. He was in his mid-80s and had been answering these same questions for more than 50 years. He was unerringly gracious. I watched him answer the same questions over and over as if they were entirely new each time. At the end of a long day, I asked, so what's it like having your life defined by a balsa raft? He was quiet for a long moment. He seemed to study my face, 
And then he answered softly, if you didn't want to be known as the woman who rode the boat, you shouldn't have rowed the boat. <laughs> His tone was not at all condescending. The words were spoken with a tenderness and an understanding that took me completely by surprise. The following day, I was standing with Mac when Thora Heyerdahl came with a question for me. Do you plan to write a book about your trip? I admitted that I had considered it. He looked at Mac and then he leaned in my direction and said, be sure to leave room enough to grow. Many have asked why I waited so many years to write this book. It took eight years. The simplest answer is that I had to get comfortable with my life defined by something as small as a rowboat before I could write about it and still leave room enough to grow. So I'll go to page one. In the end, I know I rode across the Atlantic to find my heart, but in the beginning, I wasn't aware that it was missing. In January of 1998, I asked my uncle, if I write a book about my exploration, should I write it as a comedy, a history, a tragedy, or a romance? With a twinkle in his eye, he said, a romance. It must be a romance. He explained that I was too young to write my life as a history. Who wants to read the history of half a life? Tragedy, he explained, was boring. Anyone over the age of 30 can write his or her life as a tear-soaked muddle. There's no challenge in that. My uncle counseled comedies are fine, but the greatest stories in life are about romance. I didn't doubt that my uncle spoke the truth, but there was a problem. I had no experience with romance. None. I was 35. Tragedy I could write. <laughs> Comedy I could write. Even history I could write, but romance was out of my depth. If I had charted a map of my life, I would have placed romance on the far side of an unexplored ocean where ships would drop off the edge of the world and the legend at the edge of the map would read, Here there be sea monsters. I considered myself a thoroughly modern woman. As a graduate of Smith College, I embraced the notion that our culture had evolved to the point where a woman might openly take on the role of an Odysseus. Like the epic hero in Homer's Odyssey, women could be clever. We could set out on epic quests of our own choosing. Like men, we could be independent and internally motivated. Women could be tested and not found wanting in trials of courage, resourcefulness, strength, and even solitude. What I didn't know was that exploring these vaguely masculine qualities would not be enough for me. I am, after all, a woman. It was not until my boat dropped off the edge of the world into the realm of sea monsters that I began to understand some of what I had been missing. So I've already given away the plot. At the end of the book, I'm married. At the beginning of the book, I have no experience with romance. <laughs> and in between, there's a lot of rowing and rowing <laughs> and rowing and rowing. And because uh, I had this notion of, is it a comedy, a history, a tragedy, or a romance? And the romance doesn't happen until the very end of the book. I like, when I'm talking to, to teenagers, particularly teenage boys, I say, okay, the romance is like the last 50 pages. You just skip that part. Um, so all the opening chapters are a blend of comedy, history, tragedy. Comedy, history, tragedy. And, um, you know, the comedy is easy. My life is hysterically funny. And... Um, the, the history comes to me naturally. I'm a student of history and admire history, and so that those elements of the book just flow right in. And the tragedies, there's nothing special about me there. I think we all have tragedies. I think my uncle was right. Anyone over the age of 30 can write his or her life as a tear-soaked model. But there were elements of those tragedies that put me on particular paths that explain um, how I ended up in a rowboat in the middle of the ocean. Uh, so I'd like to read to you a section I think of as comedy, some people don't think it's all that funny, but I think it's hysterical. Um, uh, but I need to pause for a moment and, and talk about the trip. Um, it took me two tries to row across the Atlantic Ocean. The first try, I was going west to east across the North Atlantic. I left from North Carolina, bound for France. You would say, well, I leave so far south. I wanted to just chase the Gulf Stream, and the Gulf Stream is very close to uh, Cape Hatteras. And so I left from Nags Head to go and get into the Gulf Stream, and I was going to surf the Gulf Stream two-thirds of the way across the Atlantic. Now, there's no motor and no sail, but there are oars, and the Gulf Stream would have helped a lot. Um, so I went out, and I lost communications eight days from the start of the trip when the boat capsized for the first time. When I lost communications, I lost the ability to track the Gulf Stream with any precision. It's very predictable against the coast of the United States, but once it turns out towards sea, it's like a fire hose. It moves north and south, or the jet stream moves north and south with a fairly dramatic uh, shift from time to time. And so I couldn't track the Gulf Stream once I lost communications. And when I lost the Gulf Stream, the boat just stopped. 
So I rode 3,000 miles. Actually, my satellite tracking beacon aboard the boat recorded that I rode 3,400 miles. And then there was this hurricane. And because I'd lost communications, nobody could say, look out! A hurricane named Danielle came across the Atlantic Ocean. And when Hurricane Daniel arrived, it was the morning of September the 5th. That morning, the boat capsized five times. Well, five or six times. Well, was it five or was it six? Well, if you're in this little cabin bouncing around like a ping pong ball, you just see the ceiling going by. You don't really get to count how many times it went by. But after the fifth or sixth capsize of the day, I decided that I was going to get my emergency position indicating radio beacon, better known as an EPIRB. It's a distress beacon. It has one switch. You turn it on, it says, help! You don't turn it on, it doesn't say anything. So I had to get out of my cabin, out of my watertight hatch, tie into my safety tether, crawl across the deck to get the EPIRB, which I deliberately mounted on the bow bulkhead as far away from the cabin as possible, so I couldn't just set it off in a raving panic. I would have to think about it. Indeed, as in the time it took me to get out of the main hatch, tie into my safety tether, crawl across the deck to get to the EPIRB, waves were coming over the boat. It was doing this really annoying submarine thing. When your ears pop because the boat's gone so far under the surface, it's a bad sign. <laughs> and I got the EPIRB and I realized I just could not ask another human being to come out into that storm to get me. So I tied the distress beacon to my life vest. I crawled back into the cabin and I went through five or six more capsizes that day with the distress beacon tied to my life vest, not setting it off with my other hand, which is the hardest thing I have ever done. There's a piece done by Inside Edition saying, you know, 11 hours, severe shoulder injury, she called for help. You know, it makes it sound like my nail file fell overboard. I had two end over end pitch poles. One pitch pole dislocated my shoulder. The next capsize put it back into place. <laughs> this is my definition of a bad day. <laughs> and um, so two days after that storm passed, uh, I thought, you know, I'll just wait. I, the next morning, the sun came out. I bailed the water out of the boat. That evening, a hurricane named Earl passed well north of my position and triggered a number of rogue waves that started me capsizing again. And I looked out and I thought, okay, the wa waves aren't nearly as big. The winds aren't nearly as strong. It's safe enough to ask for help. And it was two days after Danielle that I set off my distress beak and I was picked up that next day by a passing container ship. It was a beautiful sunny day, not unlike today. And they threw a cargo ladder over the side, and I climbed up. It was one of the least dramatic rescues ever. And I came home to Louisville, Kentucky, home of all great ocean rowers. <laughs> and I was working for the mayor at the time, and the mayor had to leave office because of a term limit. And I was offered a job working for the boxer Muhammad Ali. And in the time I worked for Muhammad and studied his life, I thought, wait a minute, you can't be a world champion three times if you don't lose twice. Muhammad understood what it meant to get knocked on your butt and to get back up again. And he reminded me, a failure is not a person who falls. A failure is a person who doesn't get back up. And he said to me, Tori, you don't want to go through life as the woman who almost rode across the ocean. And he was right. So I had to go back. But the second time I went, the easy way. <laughs> I left the Canary Islands off the coast of Africa, and I rode to the Caribbean with the trade winds. Thank you very much. And on that trip, it, you know, uh, I had a... Uh, mentor, Gerard Debeville, he's French, he rode the Atlantic west to east, and then he rode the Pacific solo west to east. And he looked at me as we, I was getting ready to leave for that second trip, he goes, Tori, this is the Champs-Élysées of the Atlantic. <laughs> <laughs> Meaning there wasn't going to be any problem on this mid-Atlantic route, it was as safe as anything, and sure enough, it was boring for most of the trip. And I got within 400 miles of the island of Guadeloupe when a friend called, I had four redundant communication systems on the second boat. And she said, Tori, there's a ha, uh, there's a ha. Uh, there's a hurricane in the Caribbean, and it seems to be heading in your direction. I was like, no, 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 no. I do my homework. It's one of my very few virtues. I actually do my homework. I had studied hurricanes. No hurricane in recorded history had ever traveled west to east at that latitude. It does not happen. Why not? Because the trade winds blow east to west. The trade winds have blown east to west for all of recorded time. The earth spins this way, the winds blow that way. It just works that way, okay? The trade winds reversed themselves. Hurricane Lenny was the first hurricane in recorded history to travel a thousand miles west to east. And it came directly over my boat. I capsized once. It was a kind and gentle capsize. I went heels over head. You always want to go heels over head. If you go heels over head, your knees hit the ceiling first. If you go head over heels, your face hits the ceiling first. And on the second trip, I had padded the ceiling. 
That's right, that first trip I didn't expect to spend so much time on the ceiling. Uh, the storm passed. I was able to, to ride it out and I rode into the island of Guadalupe, stepped out of the boat, literally uh, into Mac's arms and um, it seems like we've been together ever since. But that's too early. Uh, uh, I need to go back to the beginning where I'm just rowing, rowing, rowing. So this is my first day realizing that I've lost the Gulf Stream and I'm not happy about it. By late afternoon, I'd rowed my hands bloody, trying to beat the countercurrent. The Gulf Stream was 46 nautical miles to the east. Each hour, I rowed the equivalent of four and a half nautical miles forward, while the current pushed me two and a quarter miles back. It would take 20 hours of nonstop rowing to reach the Gulf Stream. If I stopped rowing, the adverse current would push me in the wrong direction. For the first time in the trip, I wondered, what am I doing here? Any person who leaves the comfort of civilization is destined to ask this question from time to time. Still, asking it so early in the trip struck me as a lapse in mental fortitude. Don't let the have you ever people win. The have you ever people are the mall muffins of the spectator society. Have you ever been alone on the ocean, they ask? No. Have you ever been alone on the ocean at night? No. Have you ever been alone on the ocean at night in the dark? The penchant for redundancy among the have you ever people is enormously irritating. How are we human beings to progress without testing our limits or going beyond what is known? We must prefer risk over stalemate. Why are we supposed to be afraid of the dark? People die from hunger, from cold, from injury and illness. But what peril is there in the sun going down? It is an interior darkness, a darkness of mind that is deadly, not a dark of night. Reporter, so are you crazy? Tori, probably, aren't we all? Reporter, was there some trauma in your childhood that makes you want to do this? Tori, as a girl, I wasn't allowed to play baseball and I never got over it. <laughs> Reporter, are you an adrenaline junkie? Tori, you try rowing 12 hours a day every day for three months and see how much adrenaline you get out of it. Reporter, if you aren't going to get any money out of this, are you after fame? Tori, can you name the first woman to climb Mount Everest? Reporter, silence. Tori, her name was Yonko Tabe. Can you name the first woman to ski to the North Pole? Reporter, silence. Tori, her name was Anne Bancroft. Can you name the first woman to ski to the South Pole? Reporter, silence. Tori, a woman named Shirley Metz and I were the first women to ski to the geographical South Pole. We touched the pole at the same time so we could each claim to have been the first. Have you ever heard of either of us? Reporter, a silent shrug. Tori, men occasionally garner fame out of expeditions, women do not. Men are sometimes rewarded for their rugged individualism. Women are not. When a woman is too robust or too independent, she gets asked what her boyfriend thinks about it. <laughs> no one genuinely cares what the boyfriend thinks. They just want to know whether or not she has a boyfriend. <laughs> Reporter, well, okay then. Tori, okay then. <laughs> so with that, I'll take your questions, and I promise I won't be nearly that snide. Am I crazy? <laughs> I don't know. Probably. Yes? When you lost communication, why didn't you turn back right then? That way? Uh, I lost communications eight days from shore. And at that point, the currents were still fairly strong. And I was sure that, you know, I didn't want to turn back because it would, it, in some ways, once you're offshore in, in North Carolina, South Carolina, it's almost easier to row to France than it is to turn around because the, the currents are pushing you sort of in the right direction. And the other thing, I came fairly close to Newfoundland. I, I rode through the tail of the Grand Banks. And I could have easily rowed into uh, Newfoundland to get the satellite telephone repaired, but I was afraid the news reports would read, woman abandons attempt to row across ocean because you cannot phone home. <laughs> yes. I just want to say that uh, I'm a rower, but uh, this book is a lot more than about rowing. This is a, a book about life. It's, uh, it's a lot of not just uh, inspiration, but introspection. Yeah. And, uh, it's a real gem. It, um, as I said, it took eight years to write the book. And it took that long because I kept writing a really, really bad book. Uh, and I ended up in a Master's of Fine Arts in Writing program in Louisville, Kentucky, at Spalding, my institution. 
and I got into the program because I knew I didn't want to write a really, really bad book. And the first version of the book was all about the hurricane. Let me tell you about the hurricane. The hurricane hurt. It was really bad. It was really bad. Let me tell you all about it. Um, and the, the great debate when I first arrived home was how big were the waves? Well, my boat literally sits four feet out of the water. Anything over 25 feet looks really big. I said, they were really big. Well, I had heard that in the whole area of Hurricane Danielle, the average wave height was 35 or 40 feet. What I didn't know at the time was, and when I reported that, they figured being a female, I exaggerated, so they made, it was gospel. The waves were 30 feet. And so it was often, it was reported everywhere, the waves were 30 feet in this hurricane. In doing research for the book, I learned that I was hit by both eye walls of Hurricane Danielle. The storm had more than 2,000 miles of fetch. Right? At the eye wall, the average wave height was 70 feet. The maximum theoretical wave height was 126 feet. They were really big. <laughs> um, and, and details like that aren't even in the book, because I can't prove that they were that big. So I just left that out. As I was writing the book, it was all about the, let me tell you how I did it. Because I don't, you know, all that sort of brash. Look, it's no surprise. If you can spend three months alone in a rowboat, you're an introvert, right? <laughs> and so I kept writing about the how I did it. And so I, I worked with my first mentor in the Masters of Fine Arts and Writing program. Her name was Molly Peacock. And she she's a Canadian poet scarves, very flamboyant. And so I sent her my first 50 pages of wind and wave and nuts and bolts and solar panels and epoxy and plywood and, and then my next 50 pages of other things like that. And she wrote back, she goes, okay, I understand all this stuff about wind and waves and nuts and bolts and solar panels and plywood and epoxy and, but were you on this boat? <laughs> I said, but, but Molly, I'm really not very interesting. And she goes, and you think the nuts and the bolts are? <laughs> So, so then I had to put myself in the boat. Okay, so I read a little bit about me, and I read a little bit about the wind and the waves and the nuts and bolts. So I come to my next, it's each semester you work with a different mentor. So my next mentor was a woman named Elaine Orr. And she was from North Carolina. Orr, Orrs, Orr, Orrs, right? Got to fit perfectly, right? So it's a brief residency program. The faculty come from all over the country, indeed all over the world. And so she had no familiarity with this ocean rower from Louisville, Kentucky. And she said, what are you working on? I said, I'm working on a manuscript about taking a rowboat across the Atlantic. She goes, you mean sail? And I say, well, I'll row. And she goes, whatever. <laughs> so, so I sent her my first 50 pages of winds and waves and nuts and bolts and a little bit about me and the next 50 pages about waves and whatnot. And she writes back. Let me get this straight. You actually took a rowboat across the Atlantic Ocean? And I was like, well, yes, I did. And she goes, where did you come from? As if Mars might be the answer. And she wanted to know what twisted me, what messed me up, what put me, you know, what threw me over the edge. And so I had to open a vein and hemorrhage on the page. And, and uh, many of the tragedies written about the book came in that period when I was working with Elaine Orr, who just needed to understand, are, are you crazy and what messed you up? So my third mentor, I had been looking forward to my third mentor, was Bob Finch, who edited the Norton Anthology of Nature Writing. And Bob was very prim and proper, and I liked Bob instantly. And he said, what are you working on? I said, I'm working on this manuscript about rowing a boat across the Atlantic Ocean. And I sent him my stuff about the nuts and bolts and all about me and where I came from and what messed me up. And he went, eee! I don't know. I don't want to know all that who you are stuff. Tell me about the nature. Tell me, tell, me about, tell, me about, tell me about what you saw out there. And so, well, I saw dolphins and phosphorescence and all these magical scenes and whales and, and jellyfish. And so I wrote about all that stuff. So I get to my fourth mentor, <laughs> who was Charles Gaines, who wrote uh, uh, Pumping Iron and worked with Arnold Schwarzenegger. And he's a manly man. And I was really psyched about this because I thought, OK, this is going to be fine. So I sent him nuts and bolts and me and where I came from in nature. And he's like, whoa, kid, let me tell you a secret. This is an adventure story. Just write it as an adventure story. Don't mess it up with all this other bleh. You know, it's a winning ticket. Just cash it in. And I thought, OK. So you know, there's bravado and wind and wave and stuff going on. And let me tell you all this stuff. So I, I get to my final mentor, thank heaven. Uh, a gentleman named Roy Hoffman, who had written for the New York Times, and, and he said, so, so what do you, you know, where are you? 
I said, well, I have a thousand pages of manuscript. I have wind and wave, and I have all about me, and I have my family, and how messed up we all are, and then I have nature, and then I have adventure, and I'm really lost. And he said, okay, now, just tell me a story. And each element in the book sort of came from, from parts of each of those mentors. And I, while I wrote absolutely every word that's in the book, it was the influence of folks looking at that story from a different point of view that made it possible to write it in a, in a more, uh, just a better way. No one wants to read about how great you are. I could write a thousand things about myself that are absolutely true that make me seem like a goddess. I could write a thousand things about myself that are absolutely true that would make you think that you would not want to have me to lunch. <laughs> and the truth is somewhere in between. So, so or authenticity is somewhere in between. They're both true, but that authentic self is neither lofty nor low, um, but a little bit of both uh, from time to time. And the other thing was I needed, the only reason I had to write the book was to explain the question or answer the question, why? And the why of the book is, in some ways the book is a rewrite of the Moby Dick tale. Ahab was out to kill the white whale in revenge. I was out to kill my own sense of helplessness. And that came from some of the early tragedies in my life. And I thought, you know, if I just get one more academic degree, I won't feel helpless anymore. So I went to Smith, and then I went to Divinity School at Harvard, and then I went to law school, and then that MFA. You know, if I just climb this mountain, I won't feel helpless anymore. If I just ski across this continent, I won't feel helpless anymore. If I just row across this ocean, you know, this a theme there? Um, some Scarlett O'Hara kind of bizarre craziness. Uh, and eventually the epiphany occurs, and I realize that it was all quite silly and that what I really needed to find I had been shutting out of my life but it's way too early to get to that part just yet. <laughs> so how about I read to you um, a scene. There was a, a, a woman who came up to me one evening and she was quite annoyed about a particular passage in the book and she said you should not have put this in your book. It makes women seem weak and feeble. <laughs> I wrote a boat across the ocean. Do you think I'm really worried about being seen as weak or feeble? <laughs> so, so here's the passage. As I cooked dinner that evening, a food wrapper blew out of my hand and flew to the far corner of the bow. I grumbled after it. As I reached out to pick it up, I noticed the wrapper was stuck to something, something large and moist, and that that something was looking at me. The creature was a foot long, white and slimy, with a purple tinge around its edges. A dead squid. I did what any reasonable woman would do. I ran. Two running steps carried me from the bow bulkhead to the stern cockpit where I sat down to compose myself. That's disgusting. I can handle a dead rabbit, a dead bird, a dead horse, even, but, uh, but a dead squid, yuck. It must have been trapped when the boat capsized. Maybe the boat will capsize again and it'll go away. Tori, get a grip. No slippery dead things worth another capsize. The situation made me think about the mayor of Louisville, Jerry Abramson. <laughs> you, know, you all don't even know Jerry. It gets a huge laugh in, in Louisville. The mayor is a fastidious fellow, and during the time I worked in his office, I made an effort to dress myself appropriately. Finding stylish shoes in a size 12 had always been a problem for me. One afternoon, as I was walking beside the mayor, he looked down at my feet and noted, Got your lizard skin shoes on today. My shoes weren't lizard skin, they weren't even leather. But one didn't quibble with the mayor. Yes, sir, staying on top of things. Then the mayor turned to a nearby police officer and said, She probably killed the lizards with her bare hands. <laughs> Dead squid, I'm not touching that thing. That night as I was sleeping, I imagined I could hear the squid whimpering from the other end of the boat. About 3.30 a.m., a loud groan woke me and I realized it was just the squawking of the rudder lines in their pipes. Wide awake, I slipped into my life vest and went onto the deck to employ the bucket. When I looked up, Carl Sagan's voice from the television series Cosmos echoed in my mind, billions and billions of stars. Until that moment, I had no earthly concept of what billions and billions actually looked like. The moon had retired for the evening, but the Milky Way painted a highway of light across the night. I couldn't find the major constellations because there were too many stars. I faced north to look for Polaris, the north star. Ordinarily, the Big Dipper would point the way. I saw billions and billions of stars. Similarly, Draco and Cassiopeia were lost in a sea of sparklers. I turned toward the east and southeast to look for Venus and Jupiter. Instead of these two nearby planets, I saw billions and billions of stars. Ordinarily, I could find Vega in the west, but that night it was as indistinguishable as a single grain of sand on a beach. 
I rinsed the bucket overboard and a cloud, oh sorry, the plumbing system above the American Pearl was bucket and chuck it. <laughs> yeah. I rinsed the bucket overboard and a cloud of phosphorescent light filled the water beside my boat. I rinsed the bucket again and watched the water sparkle as if it contained a thousand lightning bugs. Three dolphins arrived. They leapt into the air and splashed back into the water. And as they did that, flames of phosphorescence trailed their powerful flukes. I couldn't see the dolphins underwater, but I could track them by the squiggles of light sparkling in their underwater wakes. The dolphins circled the boat several times before swimming off toward the south. In a speech I had written for the mayor of Louisville, I'd used the phrase, a rainbow of excellence that lights the cosmic dark. The mayor had said the line was too hyperbolic. As I knelt on deck, encircled by the celestial illumination of the stars above and the bioluminescent plankton in the sea below, the hyperbole no longer seemed exaggerated. I reached overboard, stirred the ocean with my hand, until swirls of light flowed from my fingertips. So here I am, alone, on the ocean, at night, in the dark. Lucky me, without darkness, one cannot see the stars. And the, the writing of the book also took a lovely turn when I, you know, all this stuff about me and who I am and where I came from, the, as I began to write about the tragedies, I needed to write about the people who came and picked me up off the floor, the mentors, the guides, the teachers, the folks who came and made a huge difference in my life. And as I did that, the book turned, took just a lovely turn. And while I am delighted that the book seems to be appealing to a broad audience, I very much wrote it with a teenage audience in mind of wanting everybody to know that, yeah, bad things happen to all of us, but there is magic all around us and wonderful people all around us. And if we're just attentive, those people will come into our lives and make a big difference. And so as I began to write about the mentors and friends, the, bo the book took a lovely turn. I'd like to, um, maybe I'll take a question first before I read a, a mentor passage. Yes. Um, speaking of mentors, um, I went to an all girls school called Grimmar, and my first choice was Smith, and I got laid in Smith. So I was very envious of your college experience. But um, thinking about um, President Conway and the, the talk she gave and your question about Catholicism and how she had said power is not um, given, power is okay. Power is never given, power must be taken, yeah. And I find that was really profound, but I really struggled um, with what she, I, I, I had a hard time figuring out exactly what she meant by that, and I wondered yeah. what you, how you interpreted that, and especially in light of, um, you know, divinity school and your experience, and, and your other experiences um, beyond. Yeah, I, I um, could actually read you the passage. Let me start with a different passage, and then I'll shift to the Conway passage. Um, so I met Smith. Well, actually, I'm in the middle of the ocean, and I'm thinking back on Smith. I'm in the middle of the ocean, and I'm not happy. I'm having a bad day. The wind's against me. I'm not having a good time. And I say, this is all Rita Benson's fault. I met Rita Benson in 1981 during my first year at Smith College. I was strolling through the athletic complex when this grand dame who taught at the college for more than 40 years placed herself directly in my path. She said, hello. I said, yes, ma'am. This response was not unusual. Generations of Smith women had snapped to attention at Miss Benson's feet. Her steely blue eyes looked through me. When the measuring stick of her mind had finished sizing me up, she said, you will row. She was sort of the sorting hat of Smith College. <laughs> I answered, yes, ma'am. In the spring of 1982, I learned to row on Paradise Pond in the center of the Smith campus. Under Miss Benson's tutelage, I progressed quickly. As I was shoving off the dock my first day in a racing single, Miss Benson explained what was going to happen. I know you, she said. You will row up and down here in front of the dock, and you'll row easy and you'll do just fine. Yes, Miss Benson. Then you'll decide to row around the island where no one can see. You'll take three hard strokes and the boat will turn over. No, Miss Benson, I'll take it very easily. Right, said Miss Benson. True to Miss Benson's words, I rowed up and down in front of the dock for about 45 minutes. The boat was 26 feet long, but only 12 inches wide at the water line. If I sneezed in the wrong direction, it would turn over. Still, I felt, the hang I felt as if I was getting the hang of it. Then Miss Benson went inside the boathouse to take a telephone call. I rowed around behind Paradise Island. I took three hard strokes. The boat turned over. <laughs> it was early March in New England, and the water was so cold that when I surfaced, I had to talk myself into breathing. By the time I managed to get back into the boat, row it back around the island, Miss Benson was standing on the dock. Water dripped from my hair and clothing. 
Seeing me, Miss Benson smiled a knowing smile and said, and now what are you going to do? I'm going to do whatever you tell me to do, Miss Benson. Um, so the president of Smith College at the time was a, a woman named Jill Kerr Conway. Uh, president Conway was poised, elegant, and fashion model thin. The fact that her intelligence seemed to spill out all over everywhere made her a ter terrific mo role model for Smith women. She had been raised on a sheep station in, uh, in the Australian outback, which made her just distinct enough to fit in at Smith. One evening after she delivered a remarkable lecture at the Helen Hills Hills Chapel, President Conway took questions. I leapt at the chance to ask, what would, what would a woman like you, who wasn't raised in any particular religious tradition, why would you choose to become a Catholic? Mrs. Conway smiled. She looked down for a moment as if examining a chessboard for the correct move. I was prepared to recite a litany of wrongs done to women in the history of Catholicism, and I fully expected to have an opportunity to demonstrate that knowledge. However, that evening, President Conway didn't dabble with the pawns of history. Her answer was simple and direct. Power is never given. Power must be taken. These words passed through me like a bolt of lightning. I'd never heard anything so audacious in all my life. I was awestruck. The friend seated next to me waited for a moment before whispering in my ear, have you any more questions? <laughs> and I interpreted it. She, she was raised, um, if not atheist, certainly agnostic. Uh, and there hadn't been any sort of religious tradition in her background. And she chose to become a Catholic. And I found that just just, I couldn't wrap my head around it. And when she said, power is never given, power must be taken, it was a, a, a voice to me that she needed to be at the table to change the way that church dealt with women. So fast forward, I, in July, on July 1st, I will become the first non-Catholic to lead Spalding University in its 200 year history. <laughs> and so, Hmm. Uh, and, you know, there, there are a lot of great things done in every church and a lot of bad things done in every church. Uh, and, and we just have to lean toward the good as much as we can. And Mrs. Conway was definitely about that. But she was also definitely about charging straight into the fight and making it happen. Uh, other questions? Yes. Yeah, why divinity school? I went to divinity school at Harvard, and the joke there was the Harvard cancels the divinity, the divinity cancels the Harvard, and you end up in an existential void. <laughs> I had gone to divinity school with a plan to become ordained, and I was raised a Presbyterian. Um, it wasn't my fault. I was just born into the Presbyterian church. And um, I really didn't know that Harvard was absolutely the worst place to go if you wanted to go into the ordained ministry. In the 60 people in our entering MDiv class, only one of us got ordained like, in, within a short period of time. Maybe a couple of us have, have done it since, but I'm only aware of one. And, and that was telling. It was very academic. Uh, sort of beat any, any faith out of you pretty quickly. Um, I found it again on the Atlantic pretty, pretty, pretty easily. But I was puzzled by the whole notion of why did I go to divinity school? Because my sense of destiny has been really clear like, not that I'm going anywhere in particular, but what I'm supposed to do next has always felt very clear to me. And it was very clear that I was supposed to go to divinity school, and it seemed to me that I was going to be ordained. And I was puzzled at the end when that didn't happen. And with my first meeting with the archbishop in Kentucky, I said, you know, that puzzled me for a long time, but I know we wouldn't be talking about the inauguration ceremony for a Presbyterian minister to lead Spalding University. And so things come around the way they're supposed to. At least that's what I need to believe, just to get up in the morning. Other question? Yes, sir. Um, your upbringing was very interesting. Uh, you, uh, you were sent away at 15 to uh, prep school and take care of your grandmother. Or yes. Alzheimer's. But anyway, we learned about what happened to Lamar, but what happened to your parents? Uh, my parents are still living, and they're in, they're in Florida, and things are good. We had the typical all-American dysfunctional family. I, uh, I don't talk much about my parents because they're things that are just, they're things that aren't my story to tell. And uh, I, I, they did the best they could. Uh, they did quite well, I think, in, on average. And um, I just thought I should leave it at that. Let me read to you about another mentor. Um, 
It was when I was in divinity school. It was the fall of 1986. The Master of Divinity program at Harvard was a three-year program that took the vast majority of students four years to complete. In addition to three full years of academic work, two years of field education were required. The school discouraged first-year students from beginning their field education, but I was in a rush. I went to the field education coordinator, Sister Mary Hennessy, and I demanded a field assignment. Give me the toughest placement in the city. She gave me Boston City Hospital, and she made the prediction, you will not last three weeks. I'm not sure which was more pivotal, the difficult assignment or the dire prediction. Either way, I was determined to finish the year at Boston City Hospital. BCH was a grubby place where the vast majority of patients were uninsured. Bill Lesh, the supervisor of chaplaincy, explained, the way you tell the doctors from the visitors is the doctors never make eye contact. Other students from Harvard came and went, but endeavoring to prove Sister Mary Hennessy wrong, I stayed. Bill Lesh assigned me to cover three wards, an oncology ward, a psychogeriatric ward, and an orthopedic ward that soon became the first unit in Massachusetts for patients with AIDS. Brimming with youth and enthusiasm, I managed to get thrown up on twice in my first week. I lost the white tab in my clerical collar in the washing machine. Unwilling to admit my error, I resorted to using a folded over 3x5 card in my collar. <laughs> As it turned out, the 3x5 cards came in handy for taking notes between patients. On the oncology ward, a nurse introduced me to a patient named Joseph Curran. Joe was a perfectly rational, highly educated Jesuit priest who had lost many of his essential organs to cancer. I felt like a pretender as I stood at the foot of Joe's bed. The bright-eyed skeleton before me spoke, I want to die. I stood there, dancing on the verge of panic, until the skeleton spoke again, I'd like some water. I bolted from the room, filled a glass with water, and stall walked back to Joe's bedside. Later, the nurses would give me trouble for having taken water to a patient without permission, but Joe was grateful. Joe would return that favor a thousand times over. His body had betrayed him, but his vibrant mind was ever faithful. He had been a teacher, and the fountain of his wisdom flowed freely from me. We both knew I would be his last student. Joe was my Merlin. In our several months together, Joe transformed a wobbly need young woman into a passable hospital chaplain. When I doubted my adequacy, Joe would chide, you can't travel the road to wisdom in a feather bed. When he needed advice, Joe would close his eyes and recite long passages from Shakespeare, or this one from George Bernard Shaw. Quote, this is the true joy in life, the being used for a purpose recognized by yourself as a mighty one, being thoroughly worn out before you're thrown on the scrap heap, being a force of nature instead of a feverish, selfish little clod of ailments and grievances complaining to the world that it will not devote itself to making you happy. One afternoon, Joe asked, what is it that drives you? Without thinking, I answered, my brother Lamar. I explained that my brother was developmentally disabled. Mother said I got all his brains. And do you feel guilty about that, Joe asked. No, I feel guilty because I wasn't always able to protect him. Joe smiled, guilt, the gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> your, your brother isn't here, so you find others who need protection. Who protects you? I wanted to say that I didn't need protection, but it wasn't true. If I told him that I didn't deserve protection, he would ask more questions, so I turned to the books. What shall it be today? Richard II, Act Three, Scene Two, skip to where Scroop enters. Withered and grizzled by illness, Joe was not much to look at, but the tenderness in his eyes provided safe refuge. As time went by, Joe taught me to see beyond myself. He challenged me to venture unrehearsed into rooms of pain. There were so many rooms. I watched a three-year-old boy die from diarrhea. I told shattered parents that their teenage children were, bet, were dead. They heard only solitary words, alcohol, car, accident, truck, dead. That last word always had an echo. I stayed with geriatric patients, watching them drool away the last of themselves. I stood vigil over the corpse of the homeless man who froze on a street corner during rush hour. The smell of gangrene became familiar as it seeped from gunshot wound after gunshot wound after gunshot wound. At the end of one unendurable day, I fled to Joe's room. He was asleep. I sat quietly in the chair beside his bed. Minutes later, about the time the tears began to roll into my collar, Joe's eyes fluttered open. Turning toward me, he whispered, come here. I leaned my face closer to his, close your eyes. With eyes closed, I felt Joe's bony fingers brush the hair past my ear. When his hand eased lower to cradle my jaw, I became uneasy and I shot him a sharp and wary glare. Joe responded with a light chuckle, steady now. As his other hand emerged with a tissue, I closed my eyes again and felt Joe wiping away my tears. You must let your heart be broken by the things that break the heart of God. I was a dutiful student. This lesson was too advanced for me. I thought I understood 
Having perfect faith in my own understanding was the chief folly of my youth. My heart was breaking. God's heart was breaking. These things anyone could understand. But being at ease with this brokenness, being okay with it, seemed like surrendering to helplessness. This I could not do. This lesson was too advanced for me. So um, I'm mindful that we have been together for an hour and I want to finish up, but I don't want to leave you with the impression that the book's all um, uh, bluster and, and theological searching because I seem to have read absolutely every page that mentions God. <laughs> and, um, and, and the last page I'm going to read also mentions God. So I don't want to leave you with a sense that it's a religious book because it's not at all. Um, so I need to read um, something less heavy, uh, which is the beginning of my romance with my husband. I was working for the mayor at the time. An email went out to all city employees saying that Mayor Abramson wanted a good turnout for the groundbreaking of the Louisville Slugger Baseball Park. I had nothing else to do, so I went. I was standing at the edge of a growing crowd when a tall, handsome, gray-haired man walked up and stood beside me. Have they found your boat yet? I'm sorry, I need to set this up a little better. So after my first trip, I didn't make it, returned to Louisville working for the mayor, and I, you know, I'm falling into this black hole of depression. And uh, in the midst of the hurricane, I had had a big sea anchor on the back of the boat, and it was a large parachute anchor, and it was so large and was holding the boat with such firmness that when the waves hit, I was afraid the waves were going to tear apart my transom. Now, many of you mariners would say, why didn't you put it off the front of the boat? Well, the, the bulkhead to the cabin was such a large surface area that it would have, any, any sea anchor off the bow would have invited a wave to crush this, this bulkhead. So ran the sea anchor off the stern, and I had to take off the big sea anchor and put on a smaller storm anchor that would let the boat drift a little bit as the waves hit. But I didn't have the nerve in the height of the storm to take the big sea anchor and tuck it up in its hold at the bow, so I just rolled it up in this little footwell. Uh, I didn't design the boat. Uh, it was designed by a British fellow, Philip Morrison, but I physically built it in Kentucky with the help of friends. And I rolled up this thing and tucked it into this footwell. When Gerard saw this footwell for the first time, he stepped into the footwell and he goes, ah, it is a British swimming pool. Because <laughs> the designer was British and he was French, and you know, that's what French people say. Um, and in the height of the, the storm, after the pitch pole, that, that, uh, that sea anchor came unfurled and I had hooked it into my safety tether, and so it came sideways and was holding the boat sideways so it couldn't right itself. So at the height of the storm, I had to open the hatch, let it flood the cabin, dive out onto the deck, and cut loose that sea anchor. And in the time I did that, um, cut loose the sea anchor, as the boat righted itself, it lifted my head out of the water, and I had a little American flag on this gunnel. And that American flag came out of that water just the same time my head did, which is important to the rest of this story. So Max just asked, have they found your boat yet? I looked at him, but I didn't answer. I'm Mac McClure, he said with an easy smile. Yes, I know, we met last year when I gave a speech to the downtown Rotary Club. The Rotary Club in Louisville tends to be populated by men and women in business suits. Mac had made an impression because he wore a tweed jacket, a pressed Oxford cloth shirt, blue jeans, and green rubber garden clogs. <laughs> They're gonna find your boat pretty soon, said Mac. No, it'll wash up on the coast of Africa and some fishermen will chop it up for firewood. I didn't want to discuss it, and I hoped the tone of my voice would make that clear. I think someone will find it and you'll get it back. I just gave him a shrug. He kept talking. It may drift around for a few more weeks. I stopped listening. Then to my relief, the ceremony started. Various dignitaries walked out to where the mayor's podium had been placed in the middle of a bare field. The mayor's assistant, Monica Shekels, was introduced to sing the national anthem. There was a flag. I hadn't noticed it. I stood a little straighter and placed my right hand over my heart. Monica started to sing. Oh, say, can you see by the dawn's early light? Suddenly, I was back aboard the American Pearl. I had just cut loose the big sea anchor that had kept the boat from righting itself. I was in the cabin, waist deep in water. My little flag was waving on the gunwale, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight. Tears, tears began to stream down my cheeks. No, stop, not here, not now. For pity's sake, get hold of yourself. And the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Watching that flag, I could hear thunder, feel wind, taste salt, smell fear. My hands started to shake. The tears kept coming. There was no holding them back. I tried to wipe them away. Mac McClure whispered, are you okay? I'm fine, I said a little too gruffly. 
Mac put his arm around my shoulder. How dare he? Can't he see my do not disturb sign? Nobody touches me. Not now, not ever. I wanted to hit him, but my mind balked. I can't punch a man during the Star Spangled Banner. <laughs> oh, say does that Star Spangled Banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. The song ended, but the arm around my shoulder remained. It was a strong arm, and it felt nice around my shoulder. The speeches started, but the arm remained. The arm st stayed until I was able to stop crying. Between speeches, I offered Mac a feeble thank you, and I eased out from under his arm. I'm okay, really. It's just that song. It made me remember something. It's all right. You're entitled, said Mac softly. The ceremony ended. Mac said, give me a call when they find your boat, and I'll help you rebuild it. Yeah, sure, thanks, I said. I left as swiftly as I could manage without knocking anybody down. I went home and stumbled off the edge of my map. So my favorite parts of the book, we don't have time to read, but they're the fights I had with Mac as we rebuilt the American Pearl. Uh, we had a great fight over what to call a particular kind of screwdriver. I said, Mac, would you pass me a flathead screwdriver? He says, a what? I was wearing a full face respirator. I thought perhaps I didn't enunciate well enough. So I said, could you please pass me a flathead screwdriver? He says, a what? I take off my respirator, I throw it on the deck. I need a flathead screwdriver. He looked puzzled, as if he didn't know what I was talking about. He said, could you possibly mean a slotted screwdriver? <laughs> it went a little downhill from there. <laughs> we broke up over uh, the, how to construct the dagger board aboard the American Pearl. We broke up, we were never gonna see each other again, stomped off. And the next morning I was on the rowing dock, I was supposed to be out training, a friend came up and said, Tori, you know, what's wrong? I was crying. He said, I, bro I broke up with Mac. I broke up with Mac over the dagger board. <laughs> and, and she goes, Tori, that happens to all the women I know. <laughs> and, then, and then she says, um, so is it like a 24-hour breakup or a forever breakup? What was my first rom romantic relationship? I didn't know there was such a thing as a 24-hour breakup. <laughs> it, it turned out it was a 22-hour breakup. And all was well, and, uh, but as you can see, it really is the last part of the book that the, the romance comes in. So then I reach, uh, I, I, I leave the coast of Africa, and I'm rowing toward the Caribbean, and I get this phone call about Hurricane Lenny, and Hurricane Lenny's headed for me, and Hurricane Lenny hits. And it's my moment of epiphany. Hours passed. In the cabin, I began to feel like some wild creature trapped in a corner. Over time, a suffocating sense of helplessness filled the air. It whispered to me, you aren't going to make it. You'll fail. You'll fail again. You will lose, and helplessness will win. I had come back out onto the ocean, intending to kill forever my sense of helplessness. Suddenly, I was furious. The time had come for me to slay the dragon. To hell with this storm, I said. And to the helplessness in my cabin, I said, to hell with you. That's the only swearing in the book, I swear. I did swear at Mac over the screwdriver, but he, la he allowed me to clean up the language. I strapped on my life vest and scrambled out into the storm. A wave came over the boat as I clipped my tether into the safety cable. Blind to the insanity of my actions, I stood tall and defiant on the deck. The dark sky swirled like water running down a drain. Lightning crackled blue and purple. In my rage, I thought of Lamar and the blue and purple of our bruises. I remembered with searing vividness the times I had failed to safeguard my brother and the times I had failed to protect the many others who'd come after him. I had learned a speech from Shakespeare's King Lear. I had shouted it for fun during snowstorms in the Antarctic. I'd used it to entertain friends in the midst of rain-soaked rowing races. This time I did not play at the madness of King Lear. I was the madness. Blow wind and crack your cheeks. Rage blow you cataracts and hurricanes spout. I do the whole speech in the book. I will spare you that. I had been gearing up for this fight since I was a teenager. I outroared the wind. I dared the ocean to swat me down. I conjured the wrath of nature, but this was not enough for me. I turned my anger toward God. It isn't fair for you to keep putting helplessness in my path, I bellowed. A wave slapped the boat hard, but I stood firm. I've never taken the easy way, not once. What do you want from me? I called God by all the proper names the Harvard Divinity School had taught me. Adonai, Allah, Brahmin, Elohim. What am I supposed to do? Krishna, Marduk, Odin, Shanti. What do you want from me? Shiva, Vishnu, Yahweh, here I am. My voice turned raspy and I switched to shouting at the lesser gods of wind, sea, and storm. Adad, Donar, Dylan, Indra, come on. Neptune, Raman, Rudra, Thor, and Yam. Suddenly I felt silly and self-conscious. Yam was a Phoenician god of the sea, but I couldn't help but think of the vegetable. 
Here I am, standing out in a storm, picking a fight with a potato. Part of me wanted to laugh. No, I'm angry. Yam rhymes with, in the next instant, I found myself swearing at the sky. My exercise in blasphemy didn't last that long. It wasn't that I lacked the audacity to swear at God. I just couldn't come up with that many swear words. A bolt of lightning struck the cabin behind me and I fell to my knees. I've helped the disabled. I've pulled homeless people out of dumpsters. I've comforted individuals in distress. I've put myself out there time and again. How much more do you want from me? How much more can I give? I had been so sure that rowing across the ocean was a part of my path, I had almost taken it as a calling. Had I been wrong? Had it been nothing more than an exercise in haughtiness and self-delusion? Was this not mine to do? My fury was spent. I stayed on my knees and begged God's forgiveness. A tall wave washed over the deck, submerging me for a few seconds. I didn't move. As the water cleared, I began a long series of apologies. I'm sorry that I've been too small too weak, too self-absorbed to make a difference. My arms and legs shook with shame. I'm sorry that I've not always been able to protect the people who have needed my protection. Tears streamed down my face as I began to name all the people I'd let down. My brother Lamar was the first name on that list, but many others followed. The sorrow and disappointment poured out of me. After dozens of memories, I ran out of names. Over and over, I apologized for my helplessness. When I looked up from my prayer, the storm seemed to shine blue with electrical energy. It was then I realized the sublime truth of what I had been missing. I had intended to slay the sea monster of my helplessness, but I am, after all, a woman. We don't slay our dragons, we embrace them. Helplessness was not something outside of me, some malevolent force I had to defeat. Helplessness was a part of me. I am a human being. It is our brokenness, our helplessness, which makes us human. I thought I had been trying to earn God's forgiveness, but the forgiveness I needed was my own. I had only to forgive myself. I thought that rowing across the ocean would make me stronger, wiser, less susceptible to the vicissitudes of human existence. What I didn't realize is that rowing across the ocean would not make me any less human. I needed to accept my dragons. I needed to make peace with my helplessness. Still on my knees, I prayed a prayer of thanksgiving. It was a prayer of atonement, atonement, at one I no longer felt alone. I felt at one with nature, with the storm, and with myself, and with the rest of humanity. In that sense of oneness, I felt a stronger love than anything I'd ever experienced. It was as if I could feel the good wishes of friends back home. I could feel the prayers of all the people who were hoping I would weather the storm. Our helplessness makes us human. Love is what makes humanity bearable. If there was to be any salvation for me, it would come through the redeeming gift of love. I remembered my uncle's words, a romance, the greatest stories in life are about romance. <laughs>